So, what I want to do now is just open it up for questions. And this is good, this is a, a relatively small group, which means that I can get through a decent percentage of the questions that are asked. Uh, all you, you've got to do is raise your hand, we've got some microphones in the audience. Uh, and I'm going to go, boy, girl, boy, girl. <laughs> Senator Obama, my question to you is, I'm one of the baby boomers that have lost a lot of money in our retirement accounts. How can we afford to retire? Are we going to be able to have to work forever? And what can you do to help us? Well, look, this is a huge uh, issue. In fact, I, I did a whole town hall meeting just on retirement security yesterday. Uh, so let me just pick up on some of the things that, that uh, we, need to, we need to do. Step number one is to make sure that Social Security is there. Not just today, but tomorrow and forever. It's the most successful social program that we've ever set up. It's lifted millions of people out of power. And in fact, I was with a wonderful couple of the Paines yesterday in Ohio. Uh, he's a retired minister, uh, she's a retired nurse. Half their income comes from Social Security, half. Uh, and so we've got to make sure that's dependent. Now, we've got a long-term problem. It's not an immediate crisis, but it's a long-term problem because the population is getting older. And as a consequence, you're going to have more retirees per worker. If we don't do anything, then effectively there's going to be a cut in benefits in Social Security. And people can't afford it because they already don't have much to retire on. As a consequence, what I've said is that let's raise the cap on the payroll tax. Right now, you don't pay payroll tax after you earn your first $100,000, $102,000. Now, what that means is for 95% of Americans, they're paying payroll tax on every dime that they earn. But if you are my friend Warren Buffett, who's worth $56 billion, you're still only paying on the first $100,000, which means effectively that you're paying payroll tax on 0. .00000. I lose track of the zeros, but percent of your income. Uh, if you raise the cap, then we can stabilize the system for the long term. That is instead of raising the retirement age or cutting benefits, both of which I think are worse options. Now understand that I would apply this only to people who are making more than $250,000. All right, so in fact, this would only affect 3% of the population, but that would be enough to capture the money that's needed to help extend Social Security for another 50 years. Okay, so, so that's point number one. Point number two, even if Social oh, by the way, Part of the thing that we can't do with Social Security is privatize. Yeah. If you think about it, you think about the stress that you're feeling just looking at your 401k statement. Imagine if that was also your Social Security statement. But that is what George Bush has been advocating, and that's what John McCain advocated. John McCain is in favor of privatizing Social Security. He wants to set up private accounts. That is a mistake. First of all, uh, to set up private accounts, it would cost us a trillion dollars on the front end. And the reason is because current workers, you're not putting money into your own account. You know, right now what's happening is you're paying for existing retirees, and then hopefully young people, when they're working, they're paying for you. Well, if you want to suddenly make this a private account that's yours instead of helping current seniors, we've got to find the money to make up for it so that Seniors are getting their benefits. That's going to cost us a trillion dollars up front. But the bigger principle is that uh, you would now be subject to the whims of the marketplace. And we don't want that in Social Security. What we do want to do is encourage savings outside of Social Security. And that's why it's so important for us to set up, make sure that every employer has to set up a retirement. That, and 
they are not obligated to match uh, the savings, but the federal government under my plan would kick in uh, a little bit of money to get that retirement account started. And we have the employer set up an automatic enrollment system so that you're automatically putting a little bit in each month. Uh, you could opt out of it, but what you find out is, is that if you set up an automatic enrollment system like that, it turns out that most people will actually save more. Uh, it doesn't cost the government anything, it's just encouraging people to save the way they need, uh, the, the way they need to. So that's the second thing. The third thing, we've got to change our bankruptcy laws because what's happening is a lot of companies are going through bankruptcy just to shed their retirement obligations. And workers are left holding the bag even though the CEO is given a multi-million dollar golden parachute. And that's just not fair. My attitude is, if you've made a bargain with a worker that they are going to get a pension, then you've got to follow through with that bargain. That's the basic principle of the pension. But the last point I'll make, the last point I'll make is, if at the end of the month, you're short, month after month, year after year, you're not going to be able to save. And that's why it's so important for us to give you this tax cut, give you some extra money. And it's, that's why it's so important for us to do some other things to lift wages. We've got to create more jobs. We've got to improve the economy. We've got to create green energy sectors. We've got to stop sending a billion dollars uh, in oil payments to other countries. If we do all those things, then people generally, their incomes improve. That's what makes it easier for them ultimately to save. Okay? All right. Uh, so guys, stand up. Thank you, Senator. The most important issue to me is the Supreme Court. And that's usually distilled down to Roe versus Wade, which is obviously a very important decision. But as you know, it goes much beyond that to broader civil liberties issues and even economic issues. Do you think it's going to be a very important issue this fall? And do you think that there's a way to sort of broaden the range of the debate about what's at stake? Well, I think we should make it an issue. Look, just look at what happened yesterday. There was a 5-4 decision. Uh, a decision that said we are going to live up to our ideals when it comes to rule of law. Basically what it said was those prisoners that we hold in Guantanamo deserve to be able to go before a court and say it wasn't me or I didn't do it. Now, that is... That principle of habeas corpus, that a state can't just hold you for any reason without charging you and without giving you any kind of due process, that's the essence of who we are. I mean, you remember during the Nuremberg trials, part of what made us different was even after these uh, Nazis had, had performed atrocities that no one had ever seen before, we still gave them a day in court. And, and that taught the entire world about who we are, but also the basic principles of rule of law. Now, the Supreme Court upheld that principle yesterday. John McCain thinks the Supreme Court was wrong. I think the Supreme Court was right. Roe versus Wade, you just mentioned. Uh, John McCain has basically said that he would appoint judges who don't see a right to privacy. Uh, and as a consequence, would be likely to overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, that you, you're just one justice away from that. And you know, Justice Stevens is 85, 86, 87. Um, you know, uh, you know, he, he is he wants to retire. I suspect sometime soon. <laughs> uh, and and so what was that? Huh? He can't afford it, right? <laughs> uh, but, but, but it goes beyond that. You know, one of the things that, that people don't think about, we think about the Supreme Court, but we don't think about um, also the lower courts and all the decisions they're making on an ongoing basis. You know, when they review laws uh, to strengthen consumer protections, when they review laws 
to prevent discrimination on the workplace. There was a recent rule by the Supreme Court, some of you may have heard about, where uh, a woman had been getting paid much less than her male counterparts for years at a company. And after years, she finally found out about it, and she filed suit. She was doing the same work that men were doing, getting paid less. She finds out about it, she finds, files suit, and the court says, well, you know what, uh, the statute of limitations has passed, uh, you can't sue because you didn't bring the claim quickly enough. And she tried to point out, I didn't know about it. Well, that's all right, too bad. See, there are all kinds of those small decisions, it's small in the sense that they don't generate huge headlines like Roe versus Wade does, but makes the country a little more fair or a little less fair, depending on how the court rules. And, and, and that's even true for cases that don't go to the Supreme Court, but stay in the lower courts. So this is going to be a major issue, and people are going to have to think about it. Uh, if you want to preserve civil liberties, if you want to preserve civil rights, if you want to make sure that the courts are looking out for consumers and not just big business, then that should be a factor in your decision making in this election. Okay, great question. All right. Um, right here. Here, here. Yes, go ahead. Here, we get a mic. Just pass it, you can just pass it down. Senator Obama, uh, I just want to pick up on something that you talked about earlier in terms of creating jobs in the green sector. I am a musician, and from the perspective of arts and education, can you talk a little bit about your education policy and how we're going to create innovation in these young people at Radford Middle School and throughout the country to have the ideas and the technology and the innovation to take us into this green sector and create the change that we need in this country? And let me say, I view arts and education as an economic Policy. Absolutely. And that's important. Can we just talk a little bit Absolutely. about that? Absolutely. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. So, um, you are absolutely right. I, you know, when we were kids, we always had art and music. Uh, I mean, sometimes the music in music class wasn't what you were listening to. <laughs> you know? We had like old show tunes. <laughs> But you had it. Um, and that's not always true in a lot of schools now. It's being cut back, and part of it has to do with No Child Left Behind. Uh, which, No Child Left Behind is... Uh, let, let, let me talk about No Child Left Behind. There were a lot of good principles in, in No Child Left Behind. We want highly qualified teachers in every classroom. We want high standards for our kids. Our kids have to have high standards because they're going to be competing against kids in China and India and all around the world, Eastern Europe, who are working very hard. And that competition requires us to up our game. But the problem with No Child Left Behind, in addition to leaving the money behind, was, was that uh, high standards were measured just by a single high-stakes standardized test. And that high-stakes test, uh, first of all, didn't even come at the beginning of the year, it come in the middle of the year somewhere. Which means that teachers then have to spend time thinking about preparing for the test instead of teaching the subject matter that's relevant. It didn't measure progress during the course of the year, which means a school that has a bunch of kids coming in who are already behind and does a good job will still be penalized as having done a poor job, not taking into account where the kids start. The teachers start teaching the test, and principals and school, school superintendents have to start making decisions about, well, how much time are we going to devote to art and music, because that's not being tested. And, and I think this is a mistake. So the first thing I'd do was, would be to change the assessments in No Child Left Behind, so that there's a broader range of ways to assess school performance. I think you can still have a standardized test. I still want a standardized test, but do it at the beginning of the year, maybe at the end of the year to measure progress. Don't have it influence what's being, you know, how curriculum is being shaped during the year. Get teacher input and principal input into designing these assessments. So that's step number one. Step number two is 
what we have to do is, is to invest in early childhood education to close the achievement gap because so many kids are starting already behind. And if we, every dollar you put in early childhood, you get seven to ten dollars back in improved reading scores, reduced dropout rates, and so forth. Uh, step number three is working to uh, recruit, retain, and train excellent teachers. And that means paying teachers higher salaries, and it gives means giving them more professional development. tapping into their creativity, then you start designing curriculums that tap into the children's creativity. I was in a wonderful charter school in Colorado uh, that had designed the entire school year, around, each year was designed around a theme, and this is a majority Hispanic school, but the theme that year, they called it Passages, and it was all about the African American experience. And so they incorporated music, uh, you know, tracing sort of the history of, of, of African music to, to blues, to jazz, to, to modern times, uh, along with history, along with literature. And these kids, last year, uh, the year before they started this charter school, about 50% of the kids uh, had dropped out. And now 100% of them are graduating, 100% of them are going to college because they were engaged in a curriculum that was interesting to them and seemed relevant to them. Uh, and they incorporated art and music to make school interesting. Uh, so one last point I want to make about education, because uh, I, I stopped by an eighth grade graduation the other day. Uh, I just happened to be there and the uh, principal asked me to stop by and I said hello to everybody. You know, everybody was celebrating the balloons and all this. And I, said, I think it's great that you graduated from the eighth grade, but don't overdo it on the celebration, because <laughs> it's just eighth grade. You, 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 you now have high school, you've got to graduate from there, and then you've got to go to college. We've got to go to college. So, but the problem we have is, is the college is becoming increasingly unaffordable like everything else. And if, if families, like Kelly's or the Ellis's are already having a tough time just scrimping enough money together to keep food on the table. And they're expected to also save for college and save for retirement at the same time. It's basically impossible. So what I've said is a $4,000 tuition credit for every student every year in exchange for community service and national service. Yeah. $60,000 worth of debt that puts them further in the hole before they've even started their careers. Uh, and that should apply, by the way, not just to traditional four-year students, but also to non-traditional students because a lot of uh, young people now, the pattern may be that they work for, uh, you know, they go to school for two years. They get a skill. They get trained. They work for five years. Then maybe they go back and they need to do some, uh, some more upgrading of their skills later on. We should give those non-traditional students access the ability to continually retrain in order to put them through the modern